I say the, the most important colonoscopy is to get your first one because um, that really lays the groundwork. And if you're, you know, unfortunately, some people do have a higher rate risk of ha- making lots of polyps or making these concerning polyps. And you want to know that uh, at a younger age. Welcome to Doctor's Pharmacy. I'm Dr. Mark Hyman, and that's Pharmacy and F, a place for conversations that matter. And today we're having a special house call episode with Dr. Elizabeth Boham, my colleague at the Ultra Wellness Center, where we do functional medicine better than anybody, I think. Of course, I shouldn't say that, but it, you know, it's kind of what I think. <laughs> and uh, she's just an incredible doctor, and we're going to talk about colon pops today. She's a, a physician, an MD, an RD, uh, an exercise physiologist. She teaches all over the world, and trains other doctors around functional medicine, and it's just just an all-around great human being. And today we're going to talk about something really fun, which is colon polyps and colon cancer, which is unfortunately really common um, and takes people's lives. In fact, one of my closest friends died uh, because she didn't have a colonoscopy, and it was just a horrible thing. And uh, and we now know so much about what causes them and and what to do about them, uh, but it's it's far more than just getting your colonoscopy. And that's what's so exciting. We're going to talk about why we get polyps, who gets them, what to do about them to prevent them, and what do you do if you get them. Uh, So welcome, Liz. Thank you, Mark. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be with you all. No, so, so first of all, before we get started, like what what um, what's the big deal with polyps? Because we're like we're told to get colonoscopies every two years, five years, ten years, depending on who you are. We're told that, you know, these are big deals, uh, but we're really never talk talk uh, to about how to really think about them from a functional medicine perspective in terms of prevention or treatment. It's just about going to the colonoscopy, cutting it out, or if you have colon cancer, cutting that out and taking chemo and radiation. But there's a whole other world of thinking around this that allows us to, to be much more targeted in our approach to preventing and treating these things. So talk about what are polyps, why do we get them, how, how common are they, and like, and you know, what's sort of the general thinking about them? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, polyps are these growths that occur in the in the inside of your intestine. So in your colon, you can get these growths that are polyps. And there's all sorts of different shapes and types of polyps, you know, from uh, adenomas to hyperplastic polyps. And, you know, all of that really influences how risky the polyp is in terms of it turning into colon cancer. So a percentage of these polyps can become cancerous and cause colorectal cancer. And as you mentioned, unfortunately, um, you know, there's a there's an increased rate of uh, colorectal cancer. It's the second leading cause of cancer death in the United States. And unfortunately, we're seeing a real precipitous increase in young people getting colon cancer. And yeah. you know, it's hit home for me, unfortunately, a few times um, with, with some of some really close friends of mine. And um, and so it's it's something that you know we want to think about. Uh, you know, how do we prevent these abnormal growths from occurring, uh, especially the ones that can become dysplastic or cause cancer uh, in in the body? And and there there are things that that, um, are so common, right? We we see such a high percentage of the population having this. um, and, 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 you know, I've had my colonoscopy and thank God I didn't have any polyps, but it's really common to have have these uh, be expressed in our population. And I sort of remember <clears throat> medical school learning about this guy named Dennis Burkett, who was a scientist from the UK who went to Africa and he studied the fact that, that there was such a difference in the populations of those hunter gatherers versus the ones who yes. are still African, but who'd migrated to the city and were having an urban life and adopted a lot of Western habits. And what he found was that there was like no colon cancer and no chronic disease in this group of indigenous, basically hunting gathering populations who were eating their traditional diet. And when they looked at the people in the cities who were adopting a Western lifestyle and diet, they had way more cancers and way more chronic disease. And the thing that he found was fascinating was that the the main difference was that the stool weight in other words, how much did your poo weigh, essentially, <laughs> you want a job to do that, was for the hunter-gatherers, two pounds a day. <laughs> Whereas for the 
uh, people who were living in the Western society, it was basically a few ounces. It was like four ounces. So that's pretty funny. And I think that speaks to the yeah, importance wow. of diet in regulating what happens in the gut and, and how we're beginning to understand the role of uh, our current Western diet in driving so many of the diseases. Um, and I think, you know, the, the thing about polyps is that they basically can get converted into cancer. They're like precancerous things. It's almost like getting a pap test. It's like a precancer by doing a colonoscopy. But, but they grow very slowly. Uh, they often are incidental. You don't necessarily know you have them until often it's too late. Like my friend who had colon cancer, she basically had no clue until she started having really bad symptoms and this giant cancer was blocking her rectum. Um, but you don't want to wait until that stage. You want to think about how do you proactively uh, prevent it? So t talk about some of the risk factors that we know for colon polyps and colon cancer. Well, one of the things you were just talking about in terms of the size of and the weight of the stool, it really is fiber, right? We know that what are the uh, 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 those people doing that have the, the larger stools? They're eating lots more fiber and a high, high, high fiber diet is um, great because it's, it's uh helping to pull toxins out of this out of the gut so that those that those carcinogens can't spend as much time touching the wall of the intestine and causing those shifts or changes in the cells that can go on to cause cancer. Um, that's just one of the thing the, one of the things the fiber is doing. And uh, so so a high fiber diet has been associated with a decreased risk of colon, colorectal cancer. So, um, you know, more and more and more fiber. So fiber, you know, we get from our beans and legumes, nuts and seeds, ground flaxseed, vegetables, you know, those are all high fiber foods. We know as we get older, our risk increases for polyps and colorectal cancer. We know that as we gain weight, as our BMI increases, especially that belly fat, um, you know, that, that belly fat mm, that mm -hmm. increases inflammation in the body, um, you know, that causes an increased risk of colorectal cancer. We know that lack of physical exercise increases our risk. And it may be because when we exercise, that helps improve the transit time. It helps the food move, move more quickly through the bowels. So when people have less exercise, they don't have um, as regular bowel movements, essentially. So, so lack of physical exercise, there's probably more to it than that in terms of improvement in insulin sensitivity and all sorts of things. But um, we know smoking increases risk of colorectal cancer, excess alcohol intake, eating too many processed foods, um, eating too many uh, uh, processed foods that have been uh, treated with uh, antibiotics or meats grown with antibiotics, uh, a diet that's low in vitamin C, the low in antioxidants. Um, and if you have a family history of polyp production or a family history uh, or you, you, you yourself have had previous polyps, that increases your risk as well. And inflammatory bowel disease, because there's that creates more inflammation in the intestines. So there's many things we know that increase our risk of polyp production and increase our risk of, of uh, colorectal cancer. And then there's a lot of exciting things we're going to talk about during this podcast in terms of the microbiome and how we can shift it. And that that's going to, that's going to, we're going to just learn more and more about that as well. Yeah, so true. You know, you mentioned obviously the, the obvious things, right? The, the, the insulin resistance and prediabetes, which is a huge driver of cancer. And people aren't realizing that it's not just heart yeah. disease or diabetes, but then when you eat sugar and starch, it drives cancer, particularly colon cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, pancreatic cancer, you know, a lot of the common cancers. Uh, and the fact that, you know, we, we, you know, we look at this whole issue of, of, um, diet and cancer. And one of the things I want to sort of dive into, aside from the thing you talked about needing, you know, more vitamin C and more fiber and getting off of processed foods and all, all that and getting more active and increasing fruits and veggies. Um, I want to talk about the, the issue of meat and colon cancer <laughs> for a minute. Cause, cause mm. the big reason that we're told to not eat meat, one of the big reasons is because of its association with colon cancer. 
And so I, I sort of want to dig into that a little bit because when you look at the research, it's a little more nuanced. And I've looked carefully at this because, you know, I don't want to eat meat if it's going to give me colon cancer. But I also sort of want to understand what the science says. And, and uh, what, what's your perspective on the issue of meat and slash processed meat? And is there a difference? And what should we be thinking about? And, and how does this all work? I think there's absolutely a difference with types of meat, you know, um, and I think we need to, there needs to be more research to explore this area further. But what we do know is that when people have a higher rate of processed meats in their diet, so, you know, hot dogs and uh, uh, deli meats and um that that there that that at high rates that there is some association with colorectal cancer, but what I think is important, and as you've spoken about before, is that teasing out you know what is how is that associated with other lifestyle factors is important, and and what does the rest of the diet look like, and how much vegetables is that person getting, and how is that meat produced and then processed that really influences things. So I think what's re what's important. And unfortunately, a lot of our meats are, are, are given high doses of antibiotics to cause that meat to, to those animals to grow faster and get bigger faster. So there's, you know, it, it makes sense that that antibiotic uh, fed, those antibiotic fed animals are going to influence our microbiome and our risk for cancer. Um, but I don't Absolutely. think it's so simple. Like you said, I think it's way more nuanced than that. And it's <clears throat> not just that you can't eat meat because there's a lot of good things in meat. You know, there's a lot of good nutrients and iron and, you know, uh, th that, that are harder for people to absorb when, you know, to get when they totally avoid those foods. So I think it's really yeah. critical that people are focused on the, you know, the, the grass fed, the healthier forms and, 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 to balance their proteins, you know, not just get all animal protein. I think vegetable proteins are a wonderful thing to have in your diet as well because of all the fiber they provide. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that the, one of the things I want to sort of highlight is that there's a distinction between meat and sort of grass-fed meat, and there's also a difference between meat and processed meat. Uh, and I think this is really important for people to know. When you look at the data, this was data from the um, IPCC, I think, which was the group that looks at the, the risks of cancer, uh, an international research group in the UN uh, that is independent scientists. And when they looked at the data, they, and they're looking mostly at observational data, right? So you have to understand this data doesn't prove cause and effect. Uh, they found that there was about a 20% increase in your risk of colon cancer if you basically ate, you know, bacon every day. <laughs> and, and so the yeah, I think it was like five strips, right? If you like, five strips of bacon every day your whole life. I think your it was risk, five strips. Right, yeah, yeah, it was like five goes, strips every day. Yeah. Your risk goes up by 20%. Now, that seems like a lot. First of all, if, if you're looking at an observational study, unless the risk goes up by 200%, you're probably not seeing a cause and effect relationship. Although there are theoretical mechanisms for it. Mm -hmm. However, when you look at the, the, the absolute risk, you know, the background risk in the population of getting colon cancer is 5%. What they saw with the processed meat, mainly five strips of bacon a day for the rest of your life, which nobody's going to do, I think. <laughs> I'm certainly not. Uh, the risk goes up to 6%, which is a 20% increase. Right. So this is where the statistics get super confusing for people. And there's a difference between relative risk, which is you know the relative increase is 20% from 5 to 6%, right? But if you look at the absolute increased risk, it's 6%. So if right. you want to eat a piece of bacon or meat that's processed once in a while, is that going to cause colon cancer? I don't think so. And there's another caveat here is that it's not only what you're eating, it's what you're eating it with. And if you look at the data, for example, from um, Maasai warriors and from Morocco's uh, population that eats a lot of meat, and the Maasai live on basically milk and meat, one of the distinguishing features is they cook the meat or they drink the milk with tons of spices. And the spices and the marinades actually change the quality of the interaction with your biology of the meat and actually mitigate a lot of the potential risks. So I, I, I'm not, you know, one of those guys who says, you know, meat is terrible, is going to cause cancer because I, I think the data is really weak and I think we have to put it in perspective. And like, I'm certainly not going to eat five pieces of bacon a day. I might have 
you know, some, you know, pasture raised pork bacon, you know, once a month, or I, I don't remember the last time I had it actually. <laughs> it was like maybe once every, you know, six months. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's something that we should be really focused on. It's not just what we're eating as one isolated nutrient, which is this whole nutritionism, reductionism view, but what are we, what is the overall context of our diet? And I want to get into that with you next because changing the composition of your microbiome is key to actually reducing your risk of colon cancer. Absolutely. And I don't think people recognize how critical it is to feed the good bacteria with certain foods, right? So, so we know that phytonutrients, those are the components of our plant foods, really feed the good, healthy bacteria in the gut. You know, we know that things like pomegranate, can has has substances in it like elagic tannins, which feed the good, healthy bacteria in the gut. One bacteria called acromantia, which can lower inflammation. We know that we can feed it with things like pomegranate. Um, we know that things like green tea. Green tea is um, phenomenal in its anti-angiogenic, antioxidant capacity, but it also has uh, the ability to epigenetically suppress uh, or epigenetically increase tumor suppressor genes. And that can therefore increase glutathione production, decrease risk of cancer. And so what other things we're eating with the meat and the beans and the chicken and the all, you know, the, those phytonutrients right. are critical. Getting eight to 12 servings of phytonutrients a day is critical. And you mentioned spices. They've done studies with mice and shown that curcumin, uh, that spice, um, which is a, the, the phytonutrient in turmeric, right, that that can cause less polyp production in mice. So having a diet rich in spices, rich in these polyphenols, rich in these phytonutrients really can influence our, our overall health, but because of how it feeds the microbiome. Yeah. It's, it's incredible. Hey, everybody. It's Dr. Hyman. Thanks for tuning into The Doctor's Pharmacy. I hope you're loving this podcast. It's one of my favorite things to do and introducing you to all the experts that I know and I love and that I've learned so much from. And I want to tell you about something else I'm doing, which is called Mark's Picks. It's my weekly newsletter. And in it, I share my favorite stuff from foods to supplements to gadgets to tools to enhance your health. It's all the cool stuff that I use and that my team uses to optimize and enhance our health. And I'd love you to sign up for the weekly newsletter. I'll only send it to you once a week on Fridays. Nothing else, I promise. And all you have to do is go to drhyman.com forward slash picks to sign up. That's drhyman.com forward slash picks, P-I-C-K-S, and sign up for the newsletter. And I'll share with you my favorite stuff that I use to enhance my health and get healthier and better and live younger longer. Now back to this week's episode. You know, what's really fascinating too, Liz, is that there's a particular compound in the gut that's so important for overall gut health, and it's called butyrate. Uh, and it's produced oh, yes. by the bacteria in your gut when they consume things they like to eat, like fiber and certain kinds of fiber, increase butyrate, which is what we call a short chain fatty acid. Now that's a big mouthful, but essentially... This is the fuel for the intestinal tract. And essentially, you're in this symbiotic relation with bacteria where you're feeding them, and then they're producing fuel for you. The key finding, though, was that this butyrate, when it's in high concentrations, turns on the tumor suppressor gene. So it literally shuts off the genes that cause cancer, which is kind of staggering. So eating fiber, people, oh, eating fiber, that's great, whatever, whatever. But the truth is that Honestly, we can modify our microbiome and increase these short-chain fatty acids by simply providing the raw materials we need, uh, which is kind of exciting. And we're going to go more into how do we create a healthy microbiome and how do we create a better environment there and some other factors that relate to it, such as you know B vitamins and so forth. But before we get into that, I want to I want to kind of just loop back and talk about how people can evaluate this because it's more than just a colonoscopy. There's a lot of interesting new tests and diagnostics that we haven't really talked about that I love you to share about how we screen for colon cancer and polyps. Because, you know, polyps might not be able to be d d detected yeah. from tests that look at colon cancer, for example, like a stool blood test or a DNA test, because those, those might not really detect just mild polyps. 
precancerous pus. But but let's talk about what the tests are that we should be looking at. Well, you know, one of the things I wanted to mention first, and, and it's one of the tests we do all the time, is we can measure that butyrate level, which is phenomenal. Like you were mentioning how butyrate has been associated with a lower risk of colorectal cancer. So when you have more butyrate, which is a postbiotic, which gets produced when our probiotics, our good bacteria, consume prebiotics fiber, we make these, we make this butyrate. And we can measure butyrate. We can measure it in the stool and then we can, we can, we can watch it improve when we improve the milieu in the digestive system. We know that butyrate, as you were mentioning, is so critical for healing the lining of the epithelium, the lining of the intestines, so that cancer is less likely to grow. We know that butyrate can lower inflammation in the intestines, and it, it can really help improve that barrier function and improve the immune system within the intestines. So that, that may be some of the reasons that butyrate has been associated with you know, high levels of butyrate or good levels of butyrate have been associated with lower risk of colorectal cancer. And so I think it's, it's something that we test all the time. And, and, and I think it's really a, a helpful thing to evaluate. I think you were also speaking about the tests that we do Absolutely. to screen for uh, colorectal cancer, right? So yes, you know, yes. the general recommendation is to, is to do a, a colorectal screening testing um, like uh, like a, a colonoscopy between the ages of 50 and 75. Now, some organizations have really lowered that to 45 because we are seeing, unfortunately, this increased rate of colorectal cancer in younger populations. So, so some people are recommending that we start screening at 45 all the way to 75. Um, and, and a colonoscopy is a, is a good screening test. And you, when you do a colonoscopy, you can look for polyps and if they're there, remove them, which is, which is great because if that polyp was going to go on to become a, a colon cancer, you can remove it and prevent that from happening. So it's, it's a good test that, that I always encourage people to do. And people, people don't, a lot of times people are hesitant to do it, but it's a, it really is good. And I say the, the most important colonoscopy is to get your first one because um, that really lays the groundwork. And if you're, you know, unfortunately, some people do have a higher rate risk of ha making lots of polyps or making these concerning polyps. And you want to know that at a younger age. Absolutely. So, so getting those tests and there's a DNA testing you can do for some of the, uh, uh, markers of colon cancer that are available now. There's Cologuard. So there's, there's some interesting tests that are available, but at the bottom line, you do need a colonoscopy. Uh, and I, I think if you have a family history, if you're at risk, uh, you know, there may be even earlier in indications for it. So it's super important. Now, uh, yes. what is our approach from a functional medicine perspective? Because typically from a traditional medicine perspective, you do a colonoscopy, you go in, you cut the thing out and you go, okay, I'll see you later. Come back in two years. I'll do another one. Hopefully you don't get another polyp. And, and that's, we call that, you know, active surveillance. And to me, it's, I think it's inactive. <laughs> it's doing nothing and waiting and hoping sure. instead of going, gee, why did I get the polyp in the first place? And how do I prevent that from happening? And that is the difference between functional medicine and traditional care. We're always thinking about the why, not just the what, not just do you have a colon polyp, but why do you have it? And how do we understand the biology underneath it? How do we test for what's going on that's causing it? Like, would your doctor who's a gastroenterologist look at your butyrate levels? No, they're not going to do that stool test. At the Ultra Wellness Center, we do do those tests and we do see these factors in much more uh, refined relief and can actually figure out what to do in a personalized way to help people really uh, improve their overall health and get this better. So let's talk about how do we, how do we make the body completely inhospitable to cancer and, and particularly colon cancer and colon pops and polyps in general? Yeah. How do we create a terrain where cancer is less likely to grow? And the first thing I always focus on is lowering inflammation. You want to lower inflammation locally within the intestine and lower inflammation systemically within somebody's body. And so you can measure infl inflammation by looking at things like C-reactive protein, by looking at somebody's waist to hip ratio, because that abdominal fat creates inflammation. You can measure uh, if there's inflammatory markers in the stool. 
Um, and, and you can get a sense of somebody's level of inflammation by their diet that they have, because some diets are more pro-inflammatory. And that's one of the first places we work to shift is creating, you know, shifting a patient's diet to one that's more anti-inflammatory, more rich in phytonutrients, rich in plant foods, rich in fiber, rich in omega-3 fats, and, um, and lower in, in sugars and refined carbohydrates. And so, so inflammation is one of the things I really look at testing wise and, and when you're looking at somebody's situation. We also work to lower insulin levels. We work to lower toxin levels in their body. We pay attention to their microbiome and what kind of uh, are we seeing an inflammatory bugs in their gut? Are we seeing the bugs that are associated with lower levels of inflammation in their digestive system? So we, we evaluate their microbiome. And, um, and, and of course, we pay attention to those lifestyle factors that really impact somebody's risk of, of developing cancer. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's the, those things you mentioned really key, getting insulin down, getting your toxic load down, improving the health of the microbiome, dealing with the, the yep. things that drive inflammation, right? We talked about how to build up certain good bacteria by providing the different kinds of fibers. There's soluble, insoluble fibers, there's prebiotic fibers, there's probiotics. You can take butyrate. There's all the phytochemicals in food we're talking about that help all the spices we can include in it. I love making spicy foods. I make tons of things. I use all kinds of spices. Uh, and, and, and I think that is a great way to increase the phytonutrient content and reduce inflammation. You mentioned green tea and pomegranate, curcumin, the broccoli family is fascinating. The broccoli family is, is, is one where, you know, they've actually literally measured broccoli in the urine, you know, where the byproducts of broccoli in the urine and in large populations in China and find that those who have the highest levels of these chemicals from broccoli in their urine have the lowest levels of cancer. And that's because it helps us to activate the genes that suppress cancer. It activates our detoxification system. It helps reduce inflammation. Uh, and it's powerful. Uh, flax seeds are also great, uh, as you mentioned, and, 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 and they have lots of benefits in terms of uh, doing things, fermented foods, probiotics. All these, these things are things that we can include in our general well-being and lifestyle program that help to reduce our overall risk. Um, and, and um, you know, we might be even be able to be soon in, in a much more targeted way uh, with the microbiome, able to treat people with specific compounds, whether it's adding more butyrate or whether it's particular bacteria like uh, Bifidobacterium animalis, which is low and people have colorectal cancer, to you know, basically targeted probiotic therapies for various things. So I'm sort of excited about what's happening in this world of, of the microbiome because What's going on is people really uh, can upgrade their microbiome through all these things we just discussed. Uh, one of the one of the challenges, though, for people is is uh, constipation, and that is something we're not really talking about. But it is associated mm. with increased risk of colon cancer, and of course, it makes sense because there's all this junk in there, there's toxins and crap, literally, <laughs> that is causing all these adverse biochemical reactions and activation of cancer genes if we if we don't really uh, get rid of the poop that's in there on a regular basis. And that that's really, really important. I was just going to mention, like if the stool, if it, the longer it is in contact with the cells in the colon, the more likely those toxins within the stool are, are able to damage the cell lining of the colon and trigger the, the, the inflammation or the start of cancer production. So having good regular bowel movements is really critical. And we can improve that with, you know, butyrate actually as a supplement can help people have better bowel movements. More fiber, absolutely. Ground flax seed, chia seeds, um, you know, more fiber in their diet, more water in their diet. Uh, as well as probiotics. You know, I'm sure you've found this too. You know, when you give certain blends of probiotics to people, the healthy bacteria, whether it's because it's lowering inflammation, that helps with them being having better regularity um, as well. So um, th there's so many things we can do to, to be helpful there. And so, so let's go through a case because, you know, maybe I'll illustrate a little bit better. And, and, and the reason I, was, I wanted, want to share this case with everybody is because it explains how in functional medicine, we do different diagnostic tests, we're able to do different therapies and be much more deliberate, personalized and proactive about optimizing function. And, and, and really goes back to this idea of traditional medicine being very much like 
the the old model of you know a single pill for a single disease um and and in functional medicine we don't focus so much on that we focus on the underlying terrain so how do you make your body inhospitable to disease or cancer and this is really what you've done with this guy which is pretty amazing yeah so like you said you don't want to just wait for the you know your next colonoscopy we want to be proactive to do whatever we can do to prevent the production of polyps or colon cancer. So this was a 40-year-old gentleman who came in because he wanted to prevent, he wanted to be proactive. He wanted to prevent colon cancer. And the reason he was so interested in preventing it is unfortunately he had a strong family history of colon cancer. His father had colon cancer and his uncle had colon cancer in their 60s. And so he wanted to do, he was like, I want to be proactive. I want to do whatever I can to decrease my risk. And so that's exactly what we worked on. We got a really detailed history and, and worked on where for him we needed to make improvements. And, you know, one of the things we found out when we got his detailed history is he was only having a bowel movement every third day. And so that made me concerned because of what we just spoke about, how, you know, if the, if the stool just sits there longer, then it has a, a higher risk of causing inflammation or damage in, in the cells inside the intestine. And so we want, we want to have people having at least one bowel movement a day. And so we did a stool analysis on him. And his stool analysis showed that he was low in that short-chain fatty acid butyrate. And we know, as we talked about, that low levels of butyrate have been associated with an increased risk of colorectal cancer. So I said, okay, this is where we want to focus because a lot of other a lot of his other risk factors were in good control. He had good insulin levels, his blood sugar was good, his weight was good, he was active, he was exercising, he had a pretty good healthy diet. But um, but I knew we needed to focus on bumping up this butyrate level. So we focused on increasing his fiber intake you know, and, and giving him those, that fiber, that food to feed the probiotics so they would make more butyrate, that short chain acid, short chain fatty acid butyrate. So um, we mm. really worked to shift his diet to get, get in those eight to 12 servings of phytonutrients a day and gave him some ground flaxseed and, and really increased his fiber intake. And um, that was really what made a difference. I also did give him some probiotics. I gave him a, a good general probiotic blend. Um, and um, be, uh, I also gave him some actual butyrate because his levels were low and we wanted to be more proactive. And, and so, you know, after six months or so, we rechecked his, his stool. He started to have regular bowel movements every day and we rechecked his stool and we could see his butyrate level improve and the level of good bacteria improve in his stool test. So that was really satisfying and um, he's doing really well. Uh, this is a few years later now and he's doing well and, and we hope to keep him doing well uh, uh, for many, many more years. But, you know, there's one of the things that was interesting was that sort of reading about the case you 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 uh, did was was you were able to give targeted probiotics that are studied. So so we think oh we just take yogurt or just take fermented food, but there are specific varieties of bugs that have been shown to do really different things. For example, Lactobacillus casei BL23 or Lactobacillus alphadopsis and CFM have anti-tumor properties. So they modulate immunity, they lower inflammation, they inhibit the bad yeah. bugs from growing, they help the, the gut barrier function. Uh, and there are other bacteria like Lactobacillus rhamnosus, plantarum, and various E. coli, which sounds like a bad bug, but it's actually there's, there's one that they're actually okay, make a huge difference. So in addition to, to doing those probiotics, you also give them prebiotics, fibers and fermented foods, but you also advise them on how to cut down some of the toxins, right? The, the nitrates in his diet, the uh, processed yeah. meats, the, the getting rid of pesticides by eating organic, uh, getting rid of antibiotics in his diet. And also the, the, the other thing that's really important for people to realize, and, I, and I, I'm a bad guy for this because I love to grill, but it's not good for you. And, and the heterocyclic amines in the charred meat is a big cause of cancer. Uh, but but the biohack here is if you sort of yeah. marinate your meat in a vinegar or lemon or lime or some type of acidic solution and add a lot of spices, 
it really seems to mitigate that. But you don't want to eat blackened stuff, basically. <laughs> Not too often, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, Liz, this has been a great conversation about a very uh, common condition that affects millions of people that causes so much unnecessary death. And the truth is, this is one of the cancers that nobody should die of. This is a totally preventable um, cancer in terms of death. I mean, you maybe will still get polyps or early cancer, but by proper screening, by looking at some of the other things that are setting your risk up that we look at in functional medicine, such as your microbiome or your nutritional status or toxin exposures or insulin resistance, we really take a holistic 360 view of this and we work on the biological terrain. You know, we don't want to create a container in which our bodies, in which disease grows or cancer grows. So that's the beauty of functional medicine. It's the beauty of what we do at the Ultra Wellness Center. And now we're doing a lot of virtual consults because of COVID, which is allowed to see a lot more people and we're building our staff. So, you know, we'd love to help you if you have any concerns about cancer, family history, whether it's prevention or whether it's you've already had cancer, you want to prevent it from coming back, or you actually have it and want to get a supportive approach. We really can can be guides on that process. And uh, we'd love to see you. Uh, it's pretty exciting a field now, of functional medicine, because we, we have so many more tools than than we used to and we have so much more insight than we used to and you know, even since we've been doing this you know the microbiome in the last 30 years it's just the, the research on that has exploded and now we're able to be so much more sophisticated about our targeted approaches and and it goes way deeper than what you'll get from traditional medicine and i'm just so honored to be able to work with you liz and other team members at the ultra wellness center to be able to offer these kinds of services to the population and and it's it's um it's really gratifying because you just see people change and get better and improve and you know, I, I just feel sort of grateful. Yeah, it is fun. Thank you so much, Mark. Well, thanks for this great conversation about colon polyps, probably not everybody's favorite topic. If you love this podcast, please share with your friends and family, leave a comment. Maybe you've suffered from colon polyps or figured out a way to figure it out. We didn't talk even about some of the things related to methylation, B vitamins, but there's a lot of things we can do in addition for this. Maybe you've discovered what, what works for you. Um, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And also uh, check out my new Dr. Hyman Plus, which is a uh, subscription service for exclusive content from me and my team about everything you can imagine. Uh, and it's super exciting. So check it out and we'll see you next time uh, for another episode of House Call and the Doctor's Pharmacy. Thank you.